listening to Affect Autism, where Affect is the number one tool we use in supporting child development through playful interactions. We Chose Play is a new series documenting my family's floor time journey. You can see the preview on YouTube, and you can register to watch the extended trailer for free at affectautism.com play, or just go to wechoseplay.com. With each episode, you'll glean insights, tips, and reflections, what I learned and what I know now that I would tell myself back then along the way. I hope it will support caregivers in their floor time experience. We chose play. We have joy every day. Welcome listeners, I am Daria Brown, and today we have a returning guest, Colette Ryan, who is an infant mental health specialist and a doctoral student at Fielding University's Infant and Early Childhood Development Program. And she is also a DIR expert training leader in the Developmental Individual Differences Relationship-Based Model, or DIR Floor Time, and is a coach at ICDL's DIR Home Program, which is a weekly coaching for parents and caregivers. Welcome back, Colette. Hi. <laughs> Today, we decided to discuss something that's come up many times in podcasts and in discussions in the home program. And I've never really done a podcast just on this topic of cognitive load. So we're going to come at it from a bunch of different aspects. You can think of cognitive load as sensory overload uh, in our podcast with Emil Kaus. He talked about being at university and how sensory overload really impacted his ability to focus and attend. Uh, we can talk about it as challenging at too high a developmental level. Um, if you uh, check out We Chose Play, my floor time series, you'll see a couple of examples where in doing floor time with my child, um, my husband or, or me may have come in at a bit of a higher level than my son was ready for and you start to see him dysregulate. And Maud LaRue, occupational therapist who's been on many times has discussed this, uh, you know, when a child is in a class and they can't listen and look at the teacher at the same time because of that sensory overload. So those are some of the educational implications of cognitive load. And I'm sure uh, Colette has many more examples so welcome Paulette and, and why don't you just um, give us an overview of, of what you see as cognitive load in all of the cases that you work with with families. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think the idea of cognitive load um, and talking about the brain and the brain energy can get overwhelming for many families. Um, so I like to use spoon theory to describe what cognitive load is. Um, and spoon theory was to, was developed by a woman who uh, was out to, at a diner with a, a dear friend. It was her roommate at the time. And the roommate asked her, what does it feel like to have this, this um, chronic illness that you have? And so the woman related it to spoons. She wakes up every morning, say with 10 spoons of brain energy that she gets to spend that day. So she has to budget it. If she wakes up and it's a really good day, she only is, has to use one spoon for her shower. Now she's got, whoa, she's got nine spoons to spend the rest of the day. But if she wakes up and she's really not feeling all that well, or if it's a high paying day, and she has to use five whole spoons just for her shower that only leaves her five spoons to get through the rest of the day. And so you can see how she has to budget. She has to decide what she's going to do that day, depending on how many spoons she has. Well, if we think about that with our kiddos, we can think about the fact that it might take them three whole spoons just to sit in a tin. They have to sit in a chair in a classroom chair is hard. Sometimes there's a little bit of a wiggle if the legs aren't right. And so they're using so much energy just to sit in the chair that they've used three whole spoons just to sit in the chair. And if they only have 10 to start with, they use three to sit in the chair. They might be using a spoon or two to digest their lunch or their breakfast. 
they may have to use a spoon or two to accommodate all the sounds that are going on. They have to visually attend to everything going on. There goes another whole spoon. And so now you're left in a classroom with two spoons for learning. It's not enough spoons. So we have to figure out a way to help individuals adjust their spoons. Where do you want your spoon spent? When I'm teaching um, the, the 201 and 202 classes that I teach quite frequently, this is one of the things that we really talk about with the individuals learning the model is where do you want your spoons to be spent? If you want the individual to be able to play, then you're gonna have to accommodate their body. You're gonna have to slow down or you may have to use very few words so that we don't have to use a whole bunch of spoons just for interpreting the language that's going on. And for new listeners, I'm just going to back up a little bit. So Colette also teaches uh, DIR floor time to professionals who are learning how to become DIR floor time providers uh, through the Interdisciplinary Council on Development and Learning. 201 is the uh, course to get the basic floor time certificate. 202 is the one to get the um, um, proficient. Sorry, proficient proficiency in DIR. I, I was trying to think of the word. And then mm -hmm. um, 203 is is your okay. advanced level, which which is mm -hmm. what I have. And then 204 is the expert level, and you can become a training leader. So um, Colette is often teaching courses, and in these courses providers do case, uh, case examples with clients and examples of them doing floor time. And then they get feedback uh, based on their, their application of the learnings of the course. And so um, what Colette is talking about, I'm going to refer in the blog post to some of the past podcasts that talk about these issues. So if you wanna be able to play with the child and you're not attending to their sensory processing profile and understand how their bodies are taking in sensory information. And um, two podcasts ago was the, was the podcast with Gretchen Kamke, who's also at the DIR Home Program, talking about sensory motor profiles. So that will give you all the information on that. And then Colette mentioned slowing down. So if, if we're talking really fast and our children are having a hard time processing audio stimulation or understanding words and we're talking a little blah, 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 that's overwhelming to our children. So that cognitive load is large and they may not be able to attend to us. We may not be able to get that engagement and interaction that we want in play. Mm -hmm. And if there was something else, I forget uh, what the other point was that you mentioned. I, I'm thinking about your, your bringing up the idea of slowing down and the pacing piece. We know that many people have different processing speeds and different things in a child or an individual's life can, can change their processing speed. If it happens to be a day where you've used five spoons for your shower, well, your processing speed is probably going to be very slow. And the way that we explain this to many parents is to think about, um, I live in upstate New York and Daria lives in Canada. I could drive to Daria I could go a hundred miles an hour and get there really fast, but I would not know how I got there. I wouldn't remember anything along the way. I would just know where I started and where I ended. But if I drive to Daria's house going around 50 miles an hour, I'll get to remember the route. I'll get to remember the house that we saw on the side of the road near the barn because it was so cool. Or I may remember the restaurant that we went to because we slowed it all down and I was able to process it, each piece. So if you think about play with your child or with an individual and think about throwing that ball, you're, gonna, you're throwing it and, and expecting that individual to be able to then catch it. Well, they may have seen the ball in your hand, but have no idea how the ball got to where they are because they couldn't process that. But if we roll the ball, now they can see the process of how it got there. So sometimes we need to slow it down all the action for an individual. Um, and that again, helps them with their spoons or with their cognitive load. Where do we want all their brain energy spent? We want it spent on the in interaction, not having to go really fast with their processing. 
And really at this time of COVID where, you know, every single person and, and their relatives are all getting this Omicron variant and, and people have had COVID over the past two years, you know, this awful feeling of having the flu or being run down, having this brain fog and, and just being so tired. Imagine having to perform at whatever rate that you usually do. So maybe you have a job that you're on the computer doing calculations all day, or you're interacting with customers all day and, and you need that energy. But with COVID, you just are so tired and you just don't have that energy. If we think about our children feeling like that every single day because of the um, different ways that their body takes in sensory information and, and how you mentioned like that, that ball coming at them, um, they don't actually necessarily see it unless it's moving slowly. And same thing with speaking, they might not hear everything um, and process it instantly. So if we then continue on with the next sentence and the next sentence and the next sentence, and they're still processing that sentence three sentences ago, it's gonna seem like they're not listening and they're not paying attention. And so, um, yeah, that slowing down really helps. And, and even if, if we're learning a new skill, let's think about if someone's learning to play guitar and someone just shows you all these chords and you're expected to play them really quickly. But if you slow down and practice and learn them, you know, just slowing everything down helps you take it in more. And we can think about these things for us, but for some point, for some reason, when we're playing with children, we kind of forget that maybe they're not where we're at in mm -hmm. terms of processing and and um, taking it in. Absolutely. If, 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 you, if we ever broke down the process of playing with Thomas the Train and thought about all that goes into playing with Thomas the Train, well, you have to have the word recall of, oh, who is that character, the blue one? That's Thomas. Who, what color is James? What, what color is Clarabelle? And having to remember all of that piece. Then you've got positioning. Where is my body going to be so that I can play the very best way? How much language should my play partner use so that I can stay in the interaction with the train and not and them and not have to, to process too much language? And the visuals. Now we have to come up with an idea of what, what's going to happen with Thomas the train. So you can see how many spoons goes into just playing that we think of as, oh, you know, we're just gonna go and play. But for many individuals, that takes a lot of spoons. And if they don't have the spoons to use, well, then the play is going to be pretty one-sided. And if they use up too, spoon, too many spoons during the play, then something has got to give. Is it going to be their ability to process visual, to process language, to know where their body is? Is it, is it going to be that they're going to have a toileting accident because they didn't have the spoon left over to recognize the signal that they needed to use the bathroom? We have to account for the spoons. And uh, at the time that this podcast is released, We Chose Play episode six may or may not be out yet, but it's coming soon if not. Colette coaches me through a floor time session that's happened seven years ago, but we're doing kind of a retrospective coaching example. And she brought something up that um, I guess I hadn't thought of when I was quote unquote reflecting on that video, which is I was at my son's level and we were playing a game. But at some point during the video, I stood up and my son was, I think, whatever, four or five at the time and had to then look up at me. And Colette points out how he seems a little bit, you know, dysregulated and how much work it was for him to maybe hold his head up to look at me. And that's something that a lot of people don't even think of, how mm -hmm. much easier it makes it for a younger child who's smaller when you come down at their eye level and slow it down. Mm -hmm. Just working against gravity. If you've got to look up like this, now your head is against gravity, but you also increase the visual field. 
So if I'm just looking at you while I'm playing, this is my visual field. But if I have to look up, because you're up there, I have all of this also that I have to process. So having somebody directly in front of you can, you know, we'll go back to the spoons. You'll use less spoons on your positioning so that you can then use the spoons for the interaction, which is where we really want them to be spent. And it makes me think of other examples. I know that I've heard different people say where you play with a child in different spaces affects their ability to engage. So if you're in a smaller, quieter room, that's one thing. If you're in a large gym where there's tons of space and tons of places to move, that's another thing. Add in the noise of a school, all the other kids playing and yelling and commotion. That's another thing. If you add in other kids running around at recess and you're outside in a big space with noise, that's another thing. Mm -hmm. And even Maud LaRue had mentioned when our son first went to her clinic that he was always laying on the floor and needing to feel grounded. So he would lay on the floor and take everything in. And standing up for him might have been too much because there was everything around him. But if he was on the floor laying down, he knew that stability in back of him and he just had to look at the rest of it. So all of those are examples too of putting that cognitive load on your child or using up more spoons. Right. And I love, I, I just got off a call with a family and I had suggested to them that they use that same position that you're talking about. Use it because it's obviously something that works for that child. And lay on the floor with them. Something about that position probably frees up a spoon or two and it makes the child feel good. When we think about using their spoons also, we also have to think about your example with being in a school and you've got noise and you've got visuals and you've got other kiddos and you're outside in a big space. Sometimes we also forget though that digestion takes a spoon it if so if it's after a meal time and some of our kiddos might have some more difficulty with digesting it's not something that we can see and say oh that must be bothering the child but it is something that we have to keep in mind because digestion takes energy and where did that energy come from it had to be taken from something else so we need, also need to think about digestion, um, using the bathroom, respiration. If, if my heart starts beating too fast and I don't recognize what that means, I'm going to use a whole spoon of energy just to try and understand what's going on with me. And that spoon had to come from someplace. So it makes me think of two other examples with my son that might resonate with parents. Sometimes in the afternoon at school, I will get a report that he was getting a lot more aggressive and, mm -hmm. and uh, short tempered or his patience mm -hmm. was down. And then within 30 minutes, he says, poop and runs to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's what it was, you, you know, you, you just think, well, what's going on? Why is he all of a sudden acting mm -hmm. a little bit more aggressive in that? And it's mm -hmm. that he's still working on that sense of interoception. He has the sense to know that he has to go to the washroom he's able to go there he, he's out of diapers although he was you know in diapers till at least age five and a half and really not um not able to understand necessarily his whole bodily functions around the bathroom until he was uh over seven years old mm -hmm. but now he's 12 and a half and he knows that but he's still not necessarily understanding what that aggression is coming from yet. Mm -hmm. So that's a learning process for him. Mm -hmm. And the other example that you mentioned, um, especially in summertime, when we're outside, maybe we're at Canada's Wonderland, going from roller coaster to roller coaster with dad, not with me, because I will not get on any roller coasters. And maybe they're at school running around playing at recess. My son gets really, really hot, really mm -hmm. fast his face gets super red and he's like really burning up and he might get more cranky and 
it could just simply be that that his body is trying to regulate and um, you know give him lots of water sit down in the shade that kind of thing but all of these things are things that affect us too and we've said this point at the beginning but you know if um if colette wasn't in her comfortable rocking chair she may not be able to focus on this conversation um if if I start feeling parched because the air is really dry in the winter here and I didn't have my water, I might start feeling very uncomfortable and not be able to focus on our conversation. But with our kids, it's so easy for us to forget sometimes because they're still learning so many of the skills that we take for granted. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a really good point. Um, one of the things that I think about a lot with parents is when they say things to me like but it's just a shirt or but it's just a car horn or but it's just a walk around the block that's that's for our system i i talk quite frequently about our yardstick we all have our own emotional yardstick and taking a walk for me i do it every day that's really great on my yardstick but for an individual who doesn't know why we're going outside Think about what a walk is. You go nowhere. You just take a walk around and then you go back. And the why, why am I doing this? Well, if you don't understand the why about why you're going for a walk, there goes a bunch of spoons to try and figure out why you're going on this walk. Understanding what it is, the enjoyment and the interaction of going for the walk is lost because you don't understand it, even though mom or dad or caregiver have said, it's only a walk, but it's much more than that to individuals who don't understand it. Yeah, and and I, I love that you keep bringing this stuff up because I keep thinking of examples. So yeah. <laughs> I've been trying to get my son to come on a walk with me every day, especially during the break where you know we had Christmas break and New Year's and sitting around, he's playing video games all day. Uh, we're busy trying to get our work done, so we're playing with him as much as we can, but then we get that time to ourselves when he's playing his video games, and I think to myself, oh, he's just been sitting the whole day, I need to get him to move, and so I say, okay, we're going for our walk, no, no, I don't want to, I want to keep playing my video games, mm -hmm. but um, if I s had ordered something in the mail, um, maybe there was a package coming for him or whatever uh, we ordered some toy or something which of course you know we can't just order toys all the time either but it seems to be that we are ordering lots of toys before christmas so i'll say oh um it's time for us to go check the mail mm -hmm. then not a question he yep. wants to come and this goes back to the podcast uh, colette and i did on meaning making which i'll refer to in the blog now there's meaning i understand I know what the mailbox is. I know that we walk there. I know that mom has a key. We turn the key, we open it up and there's a package waiting for me. And so now the walk has a purpose and it makes sense. Um, yeah. And then of course I try and stretch it around and say, you know, let's do three laps around the block or whatever. And I've only been mm -hmm. successful with that twice now. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, I always find that if, um, what I'll usually do is I'll, I'll use a technique that's talked about by Dr. Gordon Neufeld, who's a developmental psychologist, and he says, um, oh, now what's the word that he says it? Um, I can't remember if, if, if it's immunize uh, or something like that, but anyway, you're, you're sort of saying up front, oh, sweetie, I have to tell you something. You're probably not gonna wanna do it. So right off the bat, a lot of parents are so scared of the kids saying, no, that they sort of like, you have to do this, you have to do this but that's what gets the no. But if you first say, I know that you're gonna say no, I know that you're not gonna wanna do this, but first we're gonna do this and then we're gonna do this other fun thing. Um, and then, you know, I sort of introduce it that way. We have to go for our walk because our bodies need to move so we don't get sick. We want to keep our bodies moving so we can fight off the virus if we get it. So we're going to go around the block how many times do you think we can do it? Do you think we can do it more than once? And I think my son said three. And so I was like, yes. I was like, okay, we're gonna do three times. Oh, maybe we'll do four, let's see. And then we're gonna come back and play board game because he has this awesome game of life 
Super Mario that he loves and we play it every day numerous times and it's the most fun thing. And it's fun for me too. Um, so that way you sort of set it up um, and you know, you still may get the protest, um, but also by me doing it every day, it started to become a routine. So I still will get some protest, but he knows that it's coming every day. Like, oh, it's time for our walk to the mailbox. And then yeah. some days he'll be like, no, I want to go right back home. So we just go half a block and back. But other days I'll be able to get him around the whole block because I'll just start talking about his favorite Mario characters and just keep sort of going. And maybe he doesn't notice that, oh, look, we did a whole lap. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's different ways of um, sort of engaging you might say distracting, you might say meaning making, but um, especially for the kids that have this OCD quality about them, which my son definitely does, he gets stuck on this one idea and, and he just doesn't wanna let it go. So if, mm -hmm. if he is worried about why we're going or what it is and doesn't understand it, he really won't do it. So mm -hmm. I'm, I've sort of developed these ways that seem to work to get him and persuade him to come without using uh, discipline or, you know, this more behavioral style, like you have to do this or you won't get to play video games tonight, because that's not going to work at all. <laughs> it's not. It's not going because he's only going to do it so that he gets his video games, not because he's doing it as part of a relationship. And even then he still may just protest nonstop. And then if he doesn't do it and you try and take the video game away, well, you're going to be dealing with the tantrum for the next five hours. <laughs> and when we think about the meaning making, because again, I love meaning making, the meaning making of what a walk is, we have to, we have to provide that information like you did. We need to, to walk for our bodies so our bodies can, um, can stay healthy. And for your son, that works because he has the cognitive ability to understand it. Some of our kiddos aren't there yet and they don't understand why we're going for a walk, but they might understand if while they're walking, they found pieces of a puzzle. Let's keep going. Maybe we'll find more and keep going. Oh, there's another one. What are all these pieces of a puzzle doing out here? so that when they get home, now they have the pieces of a puzzle to put the puzzle together. So now we turn it into, instead of just saying we're going on a walk, we can say, let's go on a hunt. Let's see what we're gonna find today. Maybe we hunt for five gray stones and put them in our hunt box. Maybe the next day we need six sticks. Let's go find six sticks on our hunt. So even just changing it from saying we're going for a walk to going on a hunt, now the meaning is, ooh, we have something that we're going to do here as opposed to it's a walk and we're just going to walk out there and then turn around and come back. Mm -hmm. I've heard of um, lots of activities that my son's school does. Uh, they call it a treasure hunt mm -hmm. where they'll go and search activities Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm also thinking of some other parents that I've heard mention that their kids love to go to the park. Now, again, with COVID, it's been a little, you know, some of the parks are closed, there's not as many people out. But in, in more normal times, when kids go to the park, they love to go and watch the other kids. Some, some kids like to watch the other kids. Other kids like to go because they like to go on the slide. Other kids like to go for whatever reason. So at least if they understand we're walking to the park then that gives them the meaning. Mm -hmm. And and I'm sure there's, you know, there's an infinite number of infinite number of things that parents can do that they know will motivate their children and um, follow their children's lead on what their kids like to do that will get them to move their bodies. Mm -hmm. and, and again, thinking about my yardstick is different from your yardstick. And so we might have to do something different that motivates you as opposed to motivating me. I take the dog for a walk every day. That's my motivation is so that he'll take a nap in the afternoon. <laughs> but for other, for someone else, the motivation might be something different. And, and we need to know that our spoons are spent in a different way than another person's spoons are. 
And to sort of map this back onto cognitive load, I'm thinking of my son's profile, which he needs that vestibular movement. So movement for him is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But for some kids, you know, what if going on that walk really just takes up that cognitive load and then you have a meltdown in the middle of the street somewhere? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are ways to refill your spoons. Many people, after they eat a, you know, a, a really great meal, it refills their spoons. If you take a nap, it refills your spoons. If you have, a, for some, it's just a cup of coffee or a cold water that can give you that extra bit of energy. And for some individuals, it can be getting sensory input. If you can give, get more proprioception, if you can get more vestibular input, if that's what you need. If you can spend some time with a favorite book or um, wrapped in your favorite blanket, sometimes that can give you that little extra so that you have an extra spoon to spend. But and we want to make sure, oh, I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say, I'll refer people in the blog post to the podcast with Virginia Spielman, an occupational therapist who talks about sensory lifestyle and yes. how you can, although we didn't talk about spoon theory, fill up your spoons through different sensory activities mm -hmm. um, and interactions throughout the day. And for when a spoon theory was originally developed, the woman had a chronic illness. And so um, what she says about borrowing spoons is that she has to borrow them from the next day. So she, if she uses all of her spoons up and she really needs to do something, then she takes a spoon of energy from the next day. So she starts her day the next day with just nine spoons. For, and for a chronic illness, that, that's what needs to happen. But for individuals um, that might have a diagnosis, a sensory need, um, you can refill your spoon by getting the input that you need in order for your body to say, phew, now I feel okay again. Um, I'm also thinking of cognitive load, like we were sort of talking about sensory stuff here and, and, um, and we were talking a bit about meaning making combined with giving your body sensory input. But what about the idea of um, getting a child's cognitive load um, or spoons back up by just following their lead simply following their lead. So, you know, maybe a child is overwhelmed and, and I'm just thinking about my son as I always am. Um, if he is just, you know, I don't wanna do this, I don't wanna do this. They're, maybe they're doing a little rudimentary early math um, lesson of some kind at school and he's just like wiggling in a C and he's like, uh, and, you know, not paying attention. And you can tell he just does not wanna be there and he's about to bolt at any minute, all of a sudden, you mentioned something about Super Mario and bring in that interest piece. All of a sudden he's interested again. So it, it's kind of, um, you know, is the cognitive load too great or is it following the lead? And how do those two things interact? Mm -hmm. Because it seems like it's, it's too much for him and he doesn't like it. But the second you make it about Mario, all of a sudden it's great. And I know I used this example before, um, and I was thinking of a, a different thing this time, but this is the one I remember. They, they had virtual teaching about a year ago um, during a shutdown, a COVID shutdown. So they had given us sheets to print out that was like a grid or a graph. And we talked about this in, in a past podcast. And he was supposed to park the cars in the parking lot and count the number of cars. And if we take away this, how many are left? And he wanted none of it until we brought up his Hot Wheels, Mario Hot Wheels cars. All of a sudden, when they were the Mario Hot Wheels cars, all of a sudden he was totally into it and doing it. Mm -hmm. And when we follow the individual's lead, the lead is usually telling us that of, of the interest of the individual. So if I knew that I had to fix a carburetor on a car, and I know I have very few skills to fix that carburetor on the car, I'm gonna puff and I'm gonna puff and I'm gonna say, no, I don't wanna do this. 
But if somebody said to me, it's just like how a sewing machine works, now I'm ready to go because a sewing machine, I can relate to that. That doesn't take as many spoons. But knowing I had to fix a carburetor, I don't know if I have enough spoons to fix a carburetor. But if you say it's like a sewing machine, oh yeah, I have those spoons. So I'm thinking about your son and, and the, the idea that, that um, the activity with the cars, oh, I don't know much about this and this is making me feel uncomfortable and I'm using my spoons to deal with my anxiety. So I don't have enough left to really think about doing the activity. Oh, you're bringing in my, my Mario cars? Those I know about. They don't take as many spoons. I can do that. Yeah, it's really interesting because um, it's sort of, it, it. as a skeptical parent, I'd be going, well, wait a second. First, they were saying cognitive load is if it's this physical demand on my child but all I have to do is like change the topic and all of a sudden they can do it. So obviously it's not physical load, it's just psychological. And yeah, that may be so, but um, maybe we're talking about different types of cognitive load here. So, you know, that is something that, um, like you mentioned, when, when something is, seems like we don't know what it is, we bring in meaning to it, we make it familiar, then it seems easier. And we can all relate to everything in our lives that, make it easier. If I get something in the mail that I have to put together before I can use it, I'm like, uh, here you go, handing it to my husband, like, can you put this together? Uh, mm -hmm. I, whatever it is, like, of course, first thing that comes to mind is Ikea furniture, but even <laughs> stuff that's smaller, right? Mm -hmm. My husband has no problem doing that stuff. He should have been an engineer because he's good at that. But for me, like, whew, I could follow every direction, even cooking recipes, like, I can follow the directions immediately. It turns out terrible. <laughs> I just, I, I don't have a green thumb with gardening. I'm not good with cooking, you know, all this stuff. I can cook some things, but um, just to make a point here. And the other thing we're thinking of is that actual physical cognitive load that really is, um, you know, if you are in a super loud place. And I'm, now I'm thinking of the Culture City podcast with uh, Dr. Platzman's son um, talking about, you know, people at a hockey game where they scored four goals in the first three minutes and woo, 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 and the crowd cheering and someone has a sensory overload. Now that's a clear physical sensory overload that is overwhelming this person, um, putting them into fight or flight. That's obviously different than someone finding um, it a little bit overwhelming to do a math lesson. But they are both examples of cognitive load. And I wanna challenge us not to think about them as being psychological. I want us to think about them as being emotional because we know that a learning, that all learning happens in the context of a relationship and those relationships have emotions to them. The emotion of being able to sit in a hockey ring where you know they've scored four goals and now the sounds and the lights and everything is overwhelming. But if I really loved hockey and I was with somebody who I knew made me feel safe, then that's easier than if I go by myself and I have no one to support me. Or you're with a worker that's a stranger and someone just said, oh, I'm bringing all of these children with developmental disabilities to a hockey game and you're just sort of plopped in the seats and you don't really have that one-on-one -on -one rich support, it might be a lot harder. And the sense of agency of being able to say no. Mm -hmm. And I, I would think the lack of a sense of agency of being able to advocate for yourself, that would probably take a lot of spoons. And um, I, I feel like a broken record here, but I've now done so many podcasts that every sentence, I feel like I have a podcast that referred to that, the, the podcast on emotion seeking and saying no with um, Morgan Weissman and her colleagues. So that was one where we discussed that. And, and it's, it's a big problem, especially with some behavioral therapies where compliance is the goal. And then if the child feels like they can't say no, that really 
um, puts a lot of anxiety on them. And we can consider that cognitive load as well. That's a huge amount of, of loss of cognitive load. Um, you will lose many, many spoons if something is really hard for you or you don't want to do it and you're forced to do it. That takes a lot of spoons. There goes the relationship piece because I have nothing left for my relationship if I'm trying to deal with having to go to this hockey game when I don't want to go. And, and, and I want to relationship piece the, oh, the relationship piece is gone. And I want to clarify when you said forced, because there are a lot of people that will say nobody literally dragged and forced you to sit in that seat. No, but coercion can look very different. Like some people may look like they're cooperating because they'll get on the bus and they'll actually go to the game but they still may really not want to go and just feel that um, they have no option but to comply. Right. If you've taken away the sense of agency, I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do, but uh, am I going to enjoy it? It's the, uh, for me, it, it goes back to um, when someone says that a child really likes something because they've giggled through it. Well, giggling doesn't always mean that I really enjoy something. It can be just a reaction. And so judging how an individual enjoys something just by the fact, oh, they giggled. We have to look a little deeper than that. And I also just want to touch on um, another topic before we wrap up um, that I brought up at the beginning, which is this developmental piece. So we talk about functional, emotional, developmental capacities in floor time. The first one being regulated and able to share attention and attend, and then, you know, have engagement with someone, have these back and forth interactions until you can then problem solve with another person into emotional thinking and imaginative play and then symbolic thinking and logical thinking and so on. And so there's this developmental ladder of capacities that children move through and, and in stressful times, they'll move back down and then we'll sort of have this dance of up and down this developmental ladder as we're playing with a child in a session. And the piece that I referred to earlier where, and, and I talked about the example in We Chose Play where Colette brought it up, but there's also an example in We Chose Play episode five where did a consultation with Dr. Tippy and, and we're watching a video of my husband playing with my son and my son is into object play and I don't know what they're doing, this and that, but my husband has some kind of front loader, crane, whatever construction vehicle that's lifting stuff. And he starts to use it in a more symbolic way. And my son goes, ah, and walks away. And Dr. Tippy is coaching and saying, why do you think he walked away? Mm -hmm. And I say, oh, he didn't like that. Well, it's more than that. What is it? It's that we came in at a developmental level that was symbolic and our son isn't there yet. And right. he's saying, I can't do this. It's too much for me. And he walks away. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times parents are really focused on academics and teaching and our child should know this. And sometimes, and Dr. Glavinsky gave a good example of this too, that parents say, um, oh, well, play is, here's a, toy soldiers, play with them. Here's a car, play with them. And that's not play. Um, play might be something totally different. And the example he gave was the child stood up on the chair and then we played the chair game, under the chair, over the chair, peekaboo around the chair. So mm -hmm. that idea of where is your child developmentally is something that took me like, I think years to really grasp because mm -hmm. And I see this in the parent support group um, with on Monday afternoons online, Eastern time, which you can find by looking at icdl.com slash parents or affectautism.com slash events. It, a lot of parents will say, especially when they're new, they'll come in and, and they, they're, they're new, but they're like keen on floor time. And they'll say, oh, my child is at FEDC4 or, oh, my child is at this. And they sort of like look at that developmental ladder of the capacities and they say, yeah, my child can do this or my child can do this, but it's not a static thing. It's dynamic. It's always moving around. So 
they might have seen one day that their child was, you know, doing something quote unquote purposeful by neurotypical standards where they're driving a car to a place and they say, my child is symbolic. But the majority of the time, their child might not even be engaged in a back and forth interaction. And so, yes, they might have the capacity to be symbolic in certain areas, but what we're working on in floor time is where are they in this moment? Let's get them regulated, let's engage, let's get those interactions going. And so if you're coming in all the time way up here and they're st still not even doing those foundational capacities, your child's gonna get overwhelmed and then they wonder why they're having meltdowns. <laughs> And, and the beauty of knowing floor time and knowing development allows us to know what's going to lead us to those academics that are so important to families. Um, there's a reason why individuals play. It's through play that we learn executive functioning skills like planning, task initiation, time management. All of those things are the things we need in order to learn and we learn them in play. So it, it, it's so important that we provide and we allow and we facilitate so much play. But play by yourself, while it's good to give us a, a little bit of time to maybe cook dinner or you know, do some paperwork, it's playing with another person. That's the part that we really look at. So if that parent has seen the child drive the car over, and maybe um, feeling that that was pretend play, can they now do that with somebody else? Can the parent join, can a caregiver, another child join that play and still get that beautiful richness? When we start playing, we start the first two capacities, we use um, sensory play, things that make a sound, things that make movement, lights, um, swinging, all of those things that alert our senses. Capacities three and four, we're looking at functional play, using an item, a toy, the way it was meant to be used or that the child likes to use it. So maybe um, if they're playing with a dinosaur, the dinosaur is going to, to walk around like this, that's functional play. If it's a dolly and there's a hole for the, for the um, bottle and they're feeding the dolly, well, that's functional play. That's the way it was meant to be used. Blocks are meant to be stacked, balls are thrown. That's using the toys the way it was meant to be used. Not to be confused with, well, my kiddo has this dinosaur and he really likes to um, have it go into the shopping cart. That's okay too. <laughs> it's still using the toy. When we get up to symbolic play. Or, or can I just throw in that, uh, or my son who would take all of those toys and just throw them and drop them. And in the little scientist podcast with Virginia Spielman, she talked about that's him doing object play, cause and effect. And how, how does it happen when I drop this versus this one? This one's heavier, this one's lighter. What noise does it make when it falls? And so there's no reason that that can't be considered functional play either. It's just in a different context um, and where they are. And you were then going to get onto the symbolic. But if we back up to what Virginia was talking about, those things are things that we learn in our executive functioning skills. So he was working while he was doing that play, he was also increasing his, his skills that he would need for learning. If I watch this long enough, I'm gonna be able to see where it lands. I'm gonna be able to listen to hear what it sounds like. And those are all things that he'll be able to apply to later learning, particularly in science. But then when we get into symbolic play, now there's a story. So something's happening now with our dinosaur. He's gotta go on a hunt to find something to eat at capacity five. At capacity six, I can then pretend that this is a dinosaur and it's coming to get you. So we, we think about how can we support that child in going through development 
conserving the spoons so that the development happens in the easiest way so that we can move them up the developmental ladder because that's what's going to lead to the learning that parents are so passionate about. And, and I just want to um, caution parents listening too, because there's, you know, there's, it's such a, a fine line back and forth about following the child's lead and imposing our will on the child's play. Because uh, Julia Bascom, who, who is the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network director, I think she is, um, she had a blog post recently that talked about what she did when she was little, where she would wander, uh, walk paths in her backyard so much all day long that the grass would be brown and then her dad would get her to move over and walk over that way. And she said for her, that was her play and that was functional for her because while she was doing it, she was scripting and she was talking to herself and that's the way she was learning how to understand speech and language and later helped her do other things. And she said if someone would have forced her to you know, play with a doll in a certain way that that was like a neurotypical functional play, it wouldn't have been functional for her. But would have would have been functional for her would be an adult to come and pace with her yep. and then talk about, you know, like mm -hmm. the scripts, like maybe um, interact around that. And that's what we do in floor time. And there's a fine line because sometimes you'll see that kind of play in floor time where it's more functional, neurotypical kind of play. But we want the child to lead that play not us impose it on them because in Julia's example, um, it, w it, was, it was functional for her. So she says, always let's think about what's functional for the child and maybe they learn in a different way than we did. Mm -hmm. So I know that's always tricky with parents too because if they had this certain toy set when they were little and they played with a certain way, they want their child to play with it in the same way. And sometimes our kids don't. True, and, and I think that's the beauty of being a floor timer is that I'm not trying to to make a, ch a, a child who's neurodiverse neurotypical. It doesn't, it doesn't come into my mindset at all. I'm going to join them in the way that they like to play with something. And if, if that means stacking cups, that's what I'm playing with that day. And I'm not going to make the, the individual play with it in a certain way so that it looks more neurotypical. My job is to support the individual in developing in their capacities and how they're doing it, not how I want them to do it. And I and, think that's the beauty of the floor timer. And if you were um, getting them to do it in the way you wanted to do that, that would use up their cognitive load. So much of their cognitive load because it, it would be so uncomfortable. And they, I think we'd go into protection mode then because safety takes a lot of spoons, a lot of spoons to make yourself feel safe. And maybe we should have started that, but it's a good point to end on is that the number one thing in floor time is always, let's make sure the child feels safe. And so that safety is within the relationship with us for sure is the biggest mm -hmm. component but mm -hmm. also just in their environment and different ways we can provide and make them feel safe. And you mentioned the, the mm -hmm. hockey game, if they love hockey and they're with someone they trust, even if all that other stuff is challenging, they can sort of get through it because that safety and that cocoon of the relationship holds them in it. So mm -hmm. um, that will be our, our best defense against cognitive load for sure. Safety. But but part of the relationship and the safety is that we have to understand and attune to the child and, and know when they're not comfortable and respond to that. So they understand, oh, this person gets me, this person's gonna help me, not force mm -hmm. me to do things I can't do. Right, and, and understanding that safety doesn't always mean, um, you know, I'm not gonna run across the street or put my finger in a socket. Safety means I feel okay in this situation even though it's really loud, I know you're going to be here to protect me. Or I have this shirt on that really is so uncomfortable for me to wear, but um, I'm with you in this relationship. And so I know you're going to help me through it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Well, thank you so much, Colette. I hope that people listening understand cognitive load better. And if you have any comments or questions, you can post them in the comment section at the blog post at affectautism.com. You can always contact either of us uh, through the blog post. There'll be links there. And um, we'll be back again because we have, I think, a, a whole list of topics brewing, don't we, call that for future I think podcasts? We do. I think we do. <laughs> so um, until next time, everybody, thanks so much. Thank you, Colette. Thank you, guys. Have a great day, everybody. Until next time, here's to choosing play and experiencing joy every day. If you're a caregiver looking to implement your own floor time approach, please see the Parents Menu at ICDL.com, the Interdisciplinary Council on Development and Learning, for the virtual floor time consultations for parents. There you can schedule an appointment, look at the virtual DIR home program services, and see the weekly parent support meetings registration. We aim to help you implement the developmental individual differences relationship-based model at home, taking into account where your child is developmentally and their individual sensory processing differences within your safe and nurturing relationship to promote and support their developmental potential.